Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. The psalmist in uh, Psalm 72, 6 says this. May God be like the rain on a freshly mown lawn. May God be like showers watering the earth. How true that is this morning. (laughs) But it reminds us that God not only takes care of the earth, takes care of creation, but God takes care of us to meet what we need the most. And what we need the most is his presence, his love, his urging for us to be part of God's kingdom. And so, my friends, let us um, begin our time together with some announcements, and then I'll do an opening prayer. So if you have an announcement today, um, please come forward. And then, um, and then uh, just uh, come on up. Good morning. Good morning. So, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> it's great football weather. <laughs> uh, and I've been reminded that maybe to take into account the first NFL Sunday next time we plan our picnic. But it's happening anyway. Um, Thank you for all your donations. We're going to be inside. Um, We've got the air filter system that's just been redone. Full blast. Doors are open. Fans are on. So hopefully you have a sweater. Um, Please spread apart the best you can and masks off just for eating. Um, That's it. Lots of food. And it'll be nice to have a little longer to fellowship with each other after church. (laughs) Thank you, Nikki. Our opening song this morning is number 30, I Will Sing of the Mercies. Let us sing together. Please stand if you're able. Please join me in the responsive reading this morning. Your part is in the gold. We gather today hungering to be real with genuine intent and actions that match our hallelujahs. We are not content just To just master the power handshake of strength, we also want to master the partner handshake of mutual respect and mutual support. No more good service. We want to practice authentic faith. 
we yearn to rise above culture and prejudice to a mindset where all are invited to God's table. No more religious service. We want to practice authentic faith. Let us worship God together. Now as a practice in, uh, at Skyline, please pass the peace of Christ by passing the peace and accepting the peace. Thank you. Please join with me now in the prayer of confession. Your parts are in the bold in the bulletin and in the gold on the screen. When the busyness of our lives erodes the intentions of our hearts, merciful God, forgive us. When our personal agendas take precedence over reaching out to others, merciful God, forgive us. When we keep putting off being more active doers of the world, Merciful God, forgive us. when we only half listen to those who cry out to be fully heard, Merciful God, forgive us. now please continue in personal and silent prayer. As we become doers of the word and not merely hearers, we discover that it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, in giving of ourselves that each and every one of us receive. And it's surely evidence of the implanted word that has the power to save our souls. Therefore, this is the beautiful and great news in Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. At this time, our young disciples, our kids are dismissed. The scripture reading this morning is from James chapter 1, verses 16 through 27. And by way of introduction, James is writing a letter, which is a collection of practical instructions written to all God's people scattered over the entire world. And so the scripture reading, the message, beginning in chapter six, uh, verse 16, chapter 1. So, my very dear friends, don't get thrown off course. Every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gifts are rivers of light cascading down from the Father of light. There is nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. He brought us to life using the true word, showing us off as the crown of all his creatures. Post this at all the intersections, dear friends. Lead with your ears, 
follow up with your tongue and let anger straggle along in the rear. God's righteousness doesn't grow from human anger. So throw all spoiled virtue and cancerous evil in the garbage. In simple humility, let our gardener, God, landscape you with the word, making a salvation garden of your life. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but. Letting the word go in one ear and out the other, act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are or what they look like. But whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, the free life, even out of the corner of his eye, and sticks with it, is no distracted scatterbrain, but a man or woman of action. That person will find delight and affirmation in the action. Anyone who sets himself up as religious by talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is hot air and only hot air. Real religion, the kind that passes muster before God the Father, is this. Reach out to the homeless and loveless in their plight and guard against corruption from the godless world. This is the word of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, let me open in a word of prayer. Loving God, open our minds that we might know you. Open our hearts that we might follow you. And open our souls that we might be utterly transformed by you. In your name we pray. Amen. Here are some sayings that you might be familiar with. Actions speak louder than words. Practice what you preach. Talk is cheap. You talk a good game. Step up. Put your money where your mouth is. Earn your stripes. As you've heard these phrases, what do you think of? How can you encapsulate it? And feel free to raise your hand and say, Jesse, Pastor Jesse, this is what it all says to me. So when you're ready, shout it out or say it out loud. And by the way, speaking from the pew, this building will not come down. <laughs> I promise. Yes, go ahead. Uh, sounds like an arrogant person. And could you take off your mask while you're preaching, please? Uh, I can't. Is that uh, we, that's something, yeah, that uh, we've decided as a session. I would love to, but I, I'm, I'm hoping that this little microphone is helping. And if not, we'll have to do something different. But thank you for, for asking. What else do these words mean to you? Thank you for that comment. What else? What is it saying to you? Encapsulate it. Um, yes, go ahead, Ann. It kind of makes me feel like um, I'm not worthy or I'm not doing something right. And they say this to make the person respond that way. And Got what it. I was doing previous wasn't quite the right thing. I wasn't good enough, so I need to step up. Got it. Okay, good. Thanks, Ann. There was a hand back there, I believe. Yeah, go ahead. I love that. Get real. Yes. Thank you so much. That's right. These phrases are basically saying that there should be a strong connection to what you say and what you do. All those phrases do. You know, last Sunday I introduced the book of James as our next sermon series. And for the month of September and part of October... 
we will, we'll be looking at this idea of practical faith in an imperfect world. And it is my hope that we will be able to uh, glean and appropriate for ourselves this practical wisdom and exhortations that James writes about throughout his letter. But throughout history, the book of James was not always highly regarded or thought of as having deep theological insights. And so much so that even Martin Luther, the great Martin Luther, one of our reformers, called the book of James the epistle of straw. In other words, Luther thought this epistle was worthless and had no real value for believers. And you know, he might have been right, I don't think so, but I think his thinking was, compared to the writings of Paul in Romans, in Ephesians, in Galatians, it is so easy why not only Martin Luther, but a lot of scholars and teachers and even preachers would say this, that the book of James, you know, (laughs) is like the last player in the minor leagues, you know? It's not worthy of even being called up for a few days in the bigs, in the big leagues. You know, some have been put off by the fact that even though James is the brother of Jesus, James only mentions the name of Jesus in the whole book twice. Once in chapter 1, verse 1, and once in chapter 2, verse 1. And so... People walk away with thinking, (laughs) James is related to Jesus. And in this whole letter, he mentions Jesus twice. That's not right, they would say. Others have had a low opinion of the book of James because it seems to lift up the importance of human works over against the Apostle Paul's claim that grace and faith alone was the way of salvation. But I'm, I'm here to tell you this morning, I am so glad that the Bible was put together by our early church leaders around the 5th century and included the book of James. James made the cut. Out of 66 books of the Bible, James made it in. And I'm so glad because James is such a practical book and it outlines and gives advice on how Christians should live their faith. And here's here's a little window. Here's a little glimpse in the practical thinking and, and practical wisdom of James. In the book of Acts, chapter 15, there is a description of the gathering of the apostles of the church, of the church leaders at the Council of Jerusalem. The discussion and topic that was on the top of their meeting agenda was this. What do we do with the growing, upswelling number of Gentiles who wish to become Christ followers? And they were a lot of heavy hitters at this meeting. Paul was there. Barnabas was there. And even Peter was there. There were also believers who were from the party of the Pharisees who argued vehemently and heatedly that all the Gentiles must be first be circumcised and then follow the law of Moses. Now, you remember, the law of Moses meant following very strict regulations, very strict rituals, and very strict rules. It was arduous. It was cumbersome. And everyone gives their opinion on what to do with the growing number of Gentiles who wish to become Christ followers. James is listening very, very patiently to all the arguments. And finally, he gets up and speaks. And this is what is said as recorded in Acts 15, verse 19. James says, Brothers and sisters, listen to me. It is my judgment that we should not make it difficult 
for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Now, in my mind, you could hear a pin drop after James makes this statement. James cuts through all the red tape and basically says that people are excited. They are hungry to know Jesus. They want to follow him. They want to worship him. And they want to leave lives that would honor Jesus. Let's not make it difficult, he says. Let's remove all the barriers to following Jesus. After James gives this practical take on the issue of Gentiles wishing to follow Jesus, there is, in what I described last Sunday, another E.F. Hutton moment. When James speaks, everybody listens. And as a result of these few lines uttered by James, the gathered apostles and elders decide to choose among themselves representatives to go out to Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. They went out and said, you want to follow this Jesus? He wants to embrace you. No rituals. No rules, no regulations. By grace, you are saved. So in reading our scripture text this morning, James reveals his superpower. I like to call it his spiritual mojo. His superpower is his ability to cut through all the red tape and needs to be said without and he says what he uh, needs to be said without mincing words. In verse 20, uh, 19, 24, he says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself or herself goes away and immediately forgets what he or she looks like. James says what needs to be said. He gets wind. He gets news. He hears that there is trouble brewing among the members of the churches in Asia Minor. So very early in his letter, he addresses it. It is both poignant and to the point. Rick Morley, uh, an Episcopal priest and a blogger who I follow, writes this. Pastor Morley writes, James addresses both sides of the ugliness. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Wow! Really? James could have stopped his epistle right there, and he would have said 99% of what the church has needed to hear for 99% of its existence. He tells everyone, cool it. Slow down. And for Pete's sake... Stop being so reactionary. Whether you're right or not. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. The righteousness is the same word that we find over and over again in Paul's letters. James is saying that you could, in effect, believe in all the right things. Say all the right things. And think you are religious, but you won't find righteousness with God with snapping, reactionary anger. That's what Pastor Morley writes. James says stuff we all know to be true. We all know to be practical. 
But James says it in a way that links all the necessary ingredients to pack a punch filled with very useful and timely advice. And, you know, I love the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases it. He writes, post all this and all the intersections, dear friends. Lead with your ears, follow with your tongue, and let your anger straggle along the rear. When I was a student at Berkeley, um, these, they're, they're called handbills, but they're really posters of events that are happening uh, around the campus. And there was a, a, a big intersection called Telegraph and Bancroft. And around that intersection were about four light posts. And back then they were all wooden. They weren't metal. People got smart. And it was literally plastered with stapled posters of events happening, musicals, classes, you know, want ads. And, and most students would take a glance and look to see what was coming up. This was before the days of our smartphones when they would tell us what was going on. Eugene Peterson captures this idea. Post it on all the intersections, dear friends. And finally, James addresses those who hide behind religiosity and what I call churchianity. To say that their participation in these activities gives them the right to be called Christ followers or Jesus people. And James, using his superpowers, his spiritual mojo, says this. Anyone who sets himself or herself up as religious by talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is hot air and only hot air. Real religion, the kind that passes muster before God the Father, is this. Reach out to the homeless and loveless in their plight and guard against corruption from the godless world. Well, there it is. Do our actions speak louder than words? Do we practice what we preach? Do we put our money where our mouth is? If not, then our talk is cheap. We just talk a good game. That kind of religion, James says, is hot air and only hot air. That kind of faith that James talks about, (laughs) it's, it's, it's not a side gig, okay? It's not a side gig, It is not our plan B. It is not an app on our smartphone to tap when we need help. James says plainly, the real religion, the kind that passes muster before God, the Father is this, reach out to the homeless and loveless in their plight. After church last Sunday, I had a wonderful conversation in the lobby with someone about the so what of Bible study. And I don't have my glasses on here. So if that person is here, here, would you raise your hand? A conversation about application, so what, about Bible. Yeah, okay. I should have asked your permission before I embarrassed you, huh? It was a gorgeous conversation. So what of Bible study? That is, when we read and try to make sense of the words of the Bible, when we hear sermons of the Bible passage or that Bible passage, we should always be asking ourselves, so what? What is the lesson? What is the application? What is the thing, these words on the page, the the preacher's saying? What does it to, that it grabs my life? 
It grabs my heart. It grabs my mind and, and propels me to do something about it. That's the so what. What does it cause me to do? And James beautifully answers these questions. His application and our lesson that we can take away this morning is this. Real faith reaches out to the least, to the last, and to the lost. Real faith reaches out to the least, to the last, and to the lost. Service to others is not an option. It is not a choice from column A and column B. No, it's none of these. Service to others in God's view is who we are, fundamentally. That activity in response to God's love for us marks us forever as children of God. And we are to give away this love in acts of service, witness, and compassion. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you called out your brother, your, your, your child, James, the apostle, the writer, the brother of Jesus, the bishop in Jerusalem, to put flesh on the bones of our faith, to make it real, to make it authentic, and most importantly, to make it practical and usable and accessible in the midst of a world that denies that even faith is real, that denies that even you are not real. But you reached out to James, gave him this superpower, to cut to the red tape, to say what he needs to say and to say it like it is. And as a person said today, get real, be real. Thank you, God, that we can still read, read the printed page that can come out and remind us that you're a God that's calling us to action. We give thanks for James. We give thanks For his mind, we give thanks for his writing. In your name we pray. Amen. Our song of response is number 399. O God, who gives to humankind. If you are able, please stand.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our song of commitment is song number 745, Jesus Shall Reign. If you are able, please stand. I'm going to do a double blessing today. I'll start with the blessing of our food. We're about to dismiss and enjoying some really good food. And I can't wait. So I'll I'll bless the food and then I'll give a regular blessing and benediction. Let us pray. Loving God, you give us good things. Bless the food we're about to eat. Remind us again that these are evidence of your love for us. Lord, We know that conversation, fellowship is hard in this time of the pandemic. Uh, But still, grant us a measure of this in a safe and beautiful way. And now, my friends, may God reveal God to you face to face. May God open God's heart and to reveal a love that never diminishes. The same God that we know now will be the same God we will meet face to face. Be blessed. Be hopeful. And do this in the service of God's people. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.